When you translated, right, like, can you share some of the maybe phases or words where you found it extremely difficult to find the, you know, correct translation in English? Because sometimes I feel that, you know, like, because the way we speak and it's so rich, I I mean, I am proud to say that I feel it's more rich than the English language. So it's always difficult to translate it. So, you know, just your experience and having been translated three books, right? How do you, like, are you like 100% happy of the translation or, oh. you know, did you still like, you know, feel like, oh no, you know, I did not do justice, you know, in the translation of the emotions or the scene? Like my mother, I will not divulge where I'm most dissatisfied. <laughs> However, in all my translations, there are um, places, in, in fact, let me, let me go back one. After living in the United States, in an English language speaking country for 33 years, my ear for, in, for the English language has changed. I spoke English every day for 33 years. And the, the music, the cadence, the character of spoken English, uh, if you, when you live in an English speaking society, changes your uh, appreciation and your knowledge and your feeling for the language. So when I read the translations that I did before I came to the United States, I feel like, oh no, I have to redo this because they're not wrong, you know, but grammatically, mm. they're absolutely fine punctuation, everything, the meaning and all that are as good as I can make it, but it sounds a little bit off. It's almost as if it's out of tune, a little bit. And it's a very mm-hmm. fine feeling. And the other day I got a call from a professor saying that they wanted to use my translation of a story I'd done before called Utamacha, uh, which is still not published yet um, in book form. And I said, oh, no, no, please don't do that, you know, because I read it. I really want to redo this because it's, you know, nothing is wrong with it in terms of the English language. But as English literature, which is what I'm, I'm working with literature at this point, not just a simple translation of this yeah. word or that term or this name or that name uh, from one culture to the other. This is English and Manipuri and Japanese, I'm sure, and German. Each of these languages carries a little um, tone. There's a musicality almost. There's a rhythm. There's a certain way of saying things that are um, that have become uh, part of me now. Uh, even though English is my second language, um, and so my uh, feeling for English has, has changed after living in an English-speaking society for more than three decades. So um, that was one thing. The other thing is that each language is a window on the world, and it's a window, and it tells you how people think. Many lang- many um, uh, uh, words in any language are untranslatable into another. Yeah. The Japanese have a word for men who become fat after getting married. Married. They don't have to go to the gym anymore. Wife is cooking yeah. different <laughs> food. And they have a word for what the weight that a man gains after two or three years of wedded bliss. It's called happy fat. It translates as happy fat. It's, mm. it's fat out of contentment, for instance. They also have a word for books that you keep by your bedside that you intend to read, but you never read. You never read. (laughs) Manipuri also has so many words and concepts that are very hard to translate because they have to be uh, not just a a translation of the word, but you're basically translating the culture. Like, I'll give a very easy example. Masigi nupasi, masigi nupisi, rasi kani. What is rasi? Mm. Very difficult concept. Yeah. What is rasi? Yeah. <laughs> um, is it charm? Is it beauty? Yes. Yes. Is it rhythm? Yes. Rasi tangadi tan kaiba yate. 
Darcy Tan, mm. Dr. Kopcheva, you know, these are all, you know, very uh, uh, Manipuri specific ways of looking at the world. Like, for instance, I just wrote an essay, which I, I'll send you later, um, about Binodini's sense of beauty, because she has many descriptions of beauty in this book. It's a very beauty, be it's, a be it's a beautiful book about beauty also, about the beauty mm. of money landscape of flowers, of women, of dress, I mean, there's of the men, the masculine beauty, all descriptions of beauty. So I wrote an essay about the Manipuri sense of beauty that I was seeing in this particular book, but also remind, being reminded um, that I was told uh, by uh, Ichi um, uh, Kamala, the singer, who was very close to me, that my mother's highest regard for aesthetics was called Machutaba. Mm, Machutaba. I mean, this is a Machutaba mm. what? It's good manners, it's good ethics, it's beauty, it's balance, it's proportion, decency, good intent. So, Machutaba is the highest form, and she actually wrote an essay about it, which, uh, which I still haven't read, uh, because there are so many things that I still need to find out about the Gondini and her work, all about Machutaba as a concept of beauty, of the highest ideal of aesthetics. Yeah, so, uh, but how do we translate things like this? So that is the second point. You know? Every translate, translator is considered a traitor, in Italian, they call it traduttore, <laughs> translator, traitor. Every translation is not up to the original. In fact, Borges was saying that the original betrays the translator. He turns it around. <laughs> the translation, you know? So, but it is a, a dark and, uh, you know, it's a lonely job that uh, you're always getting criticized for because, and there are reasons to criticize it. But Penguin Modern Classics also has different ways of doing things, you know. I decided early on that I'm working on a work of literature. After reading the book again, I'm working on a work, I'm working with a work of literature. What I produce has to be literature, not simply a translation of a book of literary yeah. work. But so it's it has not to a word-to-word -word translation. Yeah. It has yeah. to also stand alone as a book of literature on its own, almost like a book of English literature, really. Because you read Murakami, and you love mm -hmm. Murakami. Have you read the Japanese original? Will you ever no. read the Japanese original? We say no. Tolstoy is a great yeah. novel, but we're reading only the translation. So it is very important that we realize that the translation has to stand as a book by itself as well, because that's the one thing that most people are going to be reading without ever going back to the original. That's true. But the people who read the original say, oh no, that, that word should be like this, yeah. that word should be like that. And yes, they have a point, it could be like this and could be like that. But I decided early on, as a work of literature, that this book would not have a glossary. I'm not going to explain. This is not a thesis. This is a beautiful work of literature, and it has to read with the flow of prose as much as possible, like the one that we know that herself wrote, because she was known for the beauty of her prose. She was not a scholar. Yeah, so absolutely. There no, there no annotation, there are no footnotes. There's no glossary. I'm not trying to be a cultural informant over here. What I'm working to is the literature of Binodini and to make it a book uh, and to make the translation also a book of literature as much as I can. And if the translation is not good enough, then it does more damage to the work because people are going to be going judging this book. Boros Hypes, Tombi, I know very well, is going to be judged by many people simply on the basis of the princess and the political agent. I'm working yeah. with someone else's book. It's a tremendous burden of responsibility. It's something that 
keeps me awake at night, has kept me awake at night for two <laughs> years now. Like, what am I doing over here? It's, it has to be done. It's so beautiful. How can I get this into, into English? And, uh, but having lived abroad, I think I ha have a little bit more confidence in doing this. Yeah. And then oh, the first print is sold out. <laughs> and then the uh, penguin has his own pl classic style of doing things. Sanathobi wants to play Khan. Am mm. I going to start explaining what Khan is? Mm. Matter, you know? So I had to find, but penguin style is to mention the first, the first mention of the word should be italicized. And then mm. because I decided not to use any glossaries or explanations, I said Khan shuffle, court shuffle board. And then from then on, I dropped the word Khan because I've mentioned it. And, uh, and subsequent references to it, I use just a shuffleboard thing because the main thing is that you don't want to trip up, trip up readers as they're reading the book, having to and being explaining to them all the different concepts because as a Tibeto Burman culture and as Tibeto Burman language, we're very distant from an Indo European language like English. So, mm -hmm. The, the distance of language and culture and the worldview and concepts of things like beauty and so on have to be kept in mind. Uh, at the same time, the reading has to be an enjoyable experience. So, so Tamo, like, you know, when you spoke about the cover, I didn't know about the history, but, you know, this one is not the original. There was not a... Yeah. Okay. So when you chose for the translation, how did you think about the picture, what you put, you know, in the cover page? Can you share a little bit on the context of, oh, you know? I'm, I'm yeah. so, so happy you brought this up. It's a really good question. Um, in fact, um, uh, yesterday, uh, I went to Kangla and presented the book as a prayer offering to Ibata Upakhangba at a shrine. And as, um, His Highness uh, Sanaja Walesemba was going to come, but he was flying off to Delhi for his swearing. But the Maharani came, Haubi, Haubi Minon, Anamika was there, and the, uh, Sana, uh, her two children, their two children were there. So we made an offering there because yeah, date, the 20th of July, when the two Kangla Sars in Kangla Fort were destroyed by the British. Hmm. And I wanted to commemorate that. We should remember, we should, there should be a, a bold letter day in our calendar. So we should know as part of a general knowledge that the Kangla Sar was destroyed on the 20th of July. 28th of July. Mm. In 1891. Mm. So the cover of the book has Kangla Sa in it. it and the Kangla Sa yes. is broke and it's got blood yeah. on it. They, yeah. just, they, they killed the five British officers in 1891, including Mr. Grimwood. They smeared blood on the faces of the Kangla Sa as offering to Nungoidi, the goddess of war. It was fulfillment of prophecy that white heads would roll in front of the Kangla Sa one day in the Shekhar Kumbaba. So, the cover, which is because the book is the few years before and after 1891, uh, the, we, I decided to, I requested them to put Kangla Sa on the cover, but a, about one that has already been broken because we're talking about the breaking of Manipur and the transition yeah. from sovereignty into part of being part of the British Indian Empire, British Raj. So that transition is represented by the Kangla Sa being uh, the symbol of Sanatobi's family. Kangasa was built by Narasing, Maharaja Narasing, uh, in 1844. It's not that old, actually. It's only, it was only there for like 50 years before it got destroyed. So that represents the old transitioning to the new. And behind that, we have the Chongabo. And that yeah. is deliberately anachronistic because when the novel ends, Chonga Bone had not been moved into, it was still under construction. But that represents the, uh, the transition to the new order of things, representing the British and Surachan Maharaj. Because Surachan, the book is very interesting because Vinodhini's own father 
is a major character in the book. So, so the the the, for, the foreground picture of the Kangna Sa and the background picture of the uh, of the palace. That's not the that's not the old palace. That's a new palace. So it's, new one. It's, yeah, it is symbolic. It is not literal. It's a book of literature. It's a book of art. So it is a juxtaposition to combine the two periods that Manipur is going through. And behind that, we have the red sky because we have yeah. a, we have a, a manuscript called Lechi Lone where you read the skies, the color of the sky, the color of the shape of the clouds to figure, to portend, to forecast whether there will be war coming, whether there will be, will be, whether there will be famine, uh, whether there's going to be good harvest. The, this, the, uh, the, um, uh, the my chose of Manipur is to look at the sky and read the sky. And so we made the sky a blood red to show the, the arrival of war and bloodshed uh, because the book is a pretty bloody 